Would you turn with me um, in your Bibles to the Old Testament, to Jeremiah chapter 11? So already there we're setting ourselves up with a great challenge to be taking something out of the Old Testament and one of the prophets, Nochal. But let's see how we go today. So um, we are doing a series as we start the year, a four-part series, where we are seeking to essentially unpack what we should believe most basically as Christians, what could be termed a, a biblical worldview, or to use a more contemporary um, term, what the Christian narrative is. And, and again, I'm going to start by just up front saying that the, there are four sort of um, key words and, and key moments in God's economy and God's plan of salvation that, that shape our, our worldview, that shape all our thinking. It's kind of these four things that you need to um, view life around. It's the reality of creation, the reality of the fall, the reality of redemption, and then the reality of new creation. Those four things, those four truths, those four realities make sense of, of life. And so the overall series is called The World um, As It Is. And we're going to see again today, I hope, that, that it is the biblical narrative that gives us the answer, the best understanding, and the most hope for this world as it is. And so really today then we are looking at part two, um, which is the rebellion, otherwise known as the fall. Are you still with me? Okay, just checking. I might be doing a lot of that today. So a common question that the world and people in general have against God is this. If there is a God, or if God is good, why is there so much evil? Perhaps it's even a question that you yourself have asked at some time. And it is. It's a real question, isn't it? Because it's a question that is birthed, no doubt, from people experiencing or seeing something of the pain, something of the hardship, something of suffering in life. I mean, we've all here this morning have in some way been touched by evil in this world. I mean, every single one of us here today, I know, have done one thing. We've all cried, haven't we? And so in a real sense, we all know that this world is, is not as it should be. We've all been affected by suffering in some way or the other. And so while it is, yes, a genuine question, the problem with the question, if God is there, why is there evil, is that it starts in the wrong place, doesn't it, this question? It starts almost with a sense of accusing God. It starts with a sense of blaming God. It starts with assuming that God is the problem. You know, if there's evil, where's God? God as if God is doing something wrong, not so. Instead of starting where? Instead of starting with us. Instead of maybe considering that we might be the problem. That, that we might in fact be the ones to blame. Now you may be thinking that's a bit of a leap too far. But let's see. Because even if we just start with where the Bible kind of began that we see from the very first sin, this was the problem. <laughs> that, that thing that happened in, in the Garden of Eden a long time ago, when Adam and Eve first disobeyed God, what we as Christians call the fall, because that's literally when the whole world fell, <laughs> when everything fell apart, when everything broke. And you recall, with that very first sin, what Adam's response was. His first instinctive response when God questioned them about what had happened. You remember what he said? The woman you put here with me made me do it. And so, like, in one go, he both blames the woman and God. You see that? For what he did. 
Now, do you see why we ask the question, where is God when there's so much evil? That's our instinct. I mean, have you not found yourself doing that in your own life? In your marriage, or, or with your kids, or, or at work with colleagues? You instinctively what? Blame others before you consider, well, maybe I'm the problem. Right or wrong? And so we need to realize that maybe that question is wrong. We need to consider that maybe the truth is that evil and wrong in the world actually fall squarely on our shoulders before it goes anywhere else. That certainly, surely is what the testimony of the world is, if you know the history of the world. But much more so, and, and much more importantly, that's the testimony of the Bible. That the problem, first and foremost, lies with us. We're going to see that now as we turn and read together Jeremiah chapter 11, verses 1 to 13. Okay, so we're making a step back in time, and we will try and fill in some of the gaps as we um, try and put ourselves where this passage is to make sense of us, to make sense of it for us today. But let's just read through that first. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, hear the words of the covenant, and speak to the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Cursed be the man who does not hear the words of this covenant, that I commanded your fathers when I brought them out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying to them, Listen to my voice, and do all that I command you. And so you shall be my people, and I will be your God that I may confirm the oath that I swore to your fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey, as at this day. So let's just pause there. Now you, you realize what, what, what God is saying to Jeremiah. He's reminding them of this original covenant, this original relationship that God formed with Israel. He delivered them from the oppression of Egypt, brought them to Mount Sinai, and they covenanted with them entered into this unique relationship with the people of Israel, unlike any of the other nations in the world, where he simply said to them, I will be your God. I've chosen you, and you will be my people. And you are to obey all that I commanded you. And wholeheartedly the people replied and said, yes, we will do as you say. And you know that that's a significant event in biblical history. So that's the context here, is is this relationship that God had set up with His people, with Israel. And ultimately then they ended up in the promised land, the land with milk and honey. Wouldn't some of that be nice right now? A glass of cold milk. And then Jeremiah answered, So be it, Lord. And then the Lord said to me, to Jeremiah, Proclaim all these words then in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. Hear the words of this covenant and do them. And so he's asking Jeremiah to repeat what God had originally declared and covenanted with his people, to remind them of this relationship, this unique, loving relationship they had with God. For I solemnly warned your fathers when I brought them up out of the land of Egypt, warning them persistently, even to this day, saying, Obey my voice. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but everyone walked in the stubbornness of his own evil heart. And therefore I brought upon them all the words of the covenant, which I commanded them to do, but they did not. And so God is reminding through Jeremiah, the people of Israel then, of, then God was, 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 was true on his covenant, and he judged his people. And you will know that in many times and in various ways for their disobedience, for their idolatry. And now he's warning them through Jeremiah that the same is going to happen to them if they don't return to him. And so again the Lord said to me, a conspiracy exists amongst the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They have turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers who refused to hear my words. And so you see, it's the same pattern that is going on. 
what their forefathers do, what the previous generation did, they are now doing. They are following in their same ways of iniquity. Big word for evil. Big word for sin. Another word for transgression. Another word for disobedience. They have gone after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant that I made with their fathers. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I am bringing disaster upon, you, upon them that they cannot escape. Though they cry to me, I will not listen to them. Then the cities of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem will go and cry to the gods to whom they make offerings, but they cannot save them in the time of their trouble. For your gods have become as many as your cities, O Judah, and as many as the streets of Jerusalem are the altars you have set up to shame, altars to make offerings to Baal. I mean, it's, it's a horrendous summary, this passage of the history of Israel and the story of God's people with Him and their relationship. It just is a, a summary of what has been for the previous couple of centuries um, in the life of God's people is this pattern of disobedience, this pattern of turning away. The very first um, generation that received this covenant that were there at Mount Sinai disobeyed. They disobeyed immediately by making a golden calf. They disobeyed again by complaining as they started out the trip to the wilderness to get to the promised land. They disobeyed again when God said enter, and they said no way, they're too big. They entered the promised land, they disobeyed again by not wiping out all the nations. And then the judges came along to help keep things together, and they disobeyed again. And then the kings came along hoping to be the answer, and they disobeyed again. You kind of think, come on, can't you get it right? I mean, God was with you. He delivered you. Don't you remember the exodus? I mean, don't you remember the plague? Don't you remember the parting of the Red Sea? Like there were fish swimming next to you there. You could see the yellow tail. You could almost touch it. Don't you remember that? Don't you remember the walls of Jericho, like, coming down? It seemed to make no difference. It seemed to make no difference. What seemed to be the pattern of the people of Israel is one of forgetting God, is one of forsaking God, is one of nothing other than rebelling against God. Building up to this passage, Jeremiah, in the first 10 chapters, kind of has been directing God's judgment and warning to the people of Israel, and doing so by highlighting and giving examples of how they had been sinning, of how they had been rejecting this God again, just like their forefathers. And, and as we sort of, this is going to take a minute or two to look at some of those other expressions of how God's people then turned from their maker and their deliverer and their creator. So we're going to get a taste of what this reality of sin that not just Israel were guilty of, but what even you and I here today are guilty of. And not just guilty of once or twice, but perhaps we could, if we we're honest, say like them guilty of repeated sin and disobedience. So turn with me, just sticking in Jeremiah, to Jeremiah chapter 1. And verse 16. Just an example of how God described their sinfulness. And I will declare my judgments against them. For all their evil in forsaking me, they have made offerings to other gods and worshipped the works of their own hands. So right there he describes how their evil is not isolated, but it is pervasive. It's, it's all their evil. How it has amounted to forsaking God. To What does it mean to forsake? It means to turn your back on and walk the other way. That's what it is. That's what sin is. It's, it's turning your back on God and walking away from Him. 
is not just stealing a cookie out of the, the cookie jar. And more than that, as part of that, it led to them making other gods and worshipping the works of their own hands. I mean, that is how foolish, that is how, how sad idolatry is, isn't it? It's literally working, worshipping at least a god of your own making. And that's what they were doing. There's this almighty, infinite, holy, transcendent God who had revealed himself to them, but they ignored all that. And they chose to make a God with their own hands that they could worship. You begin to see what the root of the problem is there, don't you? That we don't actually want the true God. If we do want to worship, we only want to worship a God of our own making. In other words, you want to worship a God that what? Suits us that will scratch when we're itching. That's the kind of God we want. That's what sin does. And so they had forsaken God and turned to other gods, no less. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 19. And so your evil will chastise you, and your apostasy will reprove, reprove you. They're, they're turning away from God, their, their rejection of God again. And know and see that it is evil and bitter. He's trying to remind them, your sin is not inconsequential. Your sin is not insignificant. Sin is, yes it is, it's evil. It's a rejection of all that is good and all that is godly. For and know that it is evil and bitter then for you to forsake the Lord your God. The fear of me is not in you, declares the Lord. And so that's their problem, ultimately, is that they no longer fear God. They no longer know who God is. They no longer have a respect for God. They no longer have an awe of God. They no longer see God as the one who is the center of their, their world and as the ruler of their lives. That God is now marginal. God is now on the periphery, and they are in the center. That's so true today, isn't it? This reality of the fear of God that is lacking in, in so many people's lives, and, and even in our lives. Well, how do we know that? How do we know the fear of God is lacking? What well, is lacking in our attitude and in our reaction, our response to sin, in our lives and in the world? Of how, the, of how even Christians so could have accepted so much sinfulness in the world. They put the world's and culture's norms above the Bible and said that's the way we go. No fear of God. In fact, if you move on to chapter um, 2 and verse 22 and 23, where he says, And though you wash yourself with lye and you use much soap, the stain of your guilt is still before me, declares the Lord God. How can you say I am not unclean? How can you say I have not gone after the bowls? Look at your way in the valley. Know what you have done. You're like a restless young camel running here and there, a wild donkey used to the wilderness, in her heat, snuffing the wind. Who can restrain her lust? No one, no, none who seek her need weary themselves in her month. They will find her. Keep your feet from going unshod and your throat from thirst. But you who said it is hopeless, for I have loved foreigners and have gone, and after them I will go. And so what the Lord is highlighting then is how they are in their own way seeking to, on one hand, wash away their guilt. All the while they are worshipping other gods. And we do the same. We can do outward acts of ritual. Uh, we can do certain external things thinking that that would make up for our sin, and all the while we go on sinning, as if it's a, a magic charm, as if we can wave a wand, as if God is like a genie, we can just rub right, and then you'll forgive us, and we're going on the way we want to. But as God highlights for them, in fact, all it is that in their sin, they are lustful. In their sin, they're like a wild animal chasing after a female in heat. You see, that is the nature of sin. It grabs us. It holds us. It drives us. It compels us. And so in the end, they have no regard for God. They have no desire to, to worship Him and to follow Him first 
and foremost. And so there's no fear of God, there's no shame for sin, there's no acknowledgement of guilt, there's no concern for judgment. Living as they please, and that's what our sin does to us as well. Later on in Jeremiah, we read probably the, one of the most sort of indicting statements about sin in the Old Testament, where Jeremiah writes in ver- chapter 17, verse 9, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Like, what would you do if you were God? How would you deal with such people? I mean, sure, given up on them a long time ago, I think. But yet God doesn't. He continues to show them mercy. Lastly, if you turn to Jeremiah 3, verse 12, where again God is pleading with them to return. Go and proclaim these words. Return, faithless Israel, declares the Lord. And I will not look on you in anger, for I am merciful, declares the Lord. I will not be angry forever. Only acknowledge your guilt that you have rebelled against the Lord your God and scattered your favors among foreigners under every green tree and you have not, and that you have not obeyed my voice. Return, O faithless children, declares the Lord. For I am your master and I will take you, one from a city and two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion. And so God continues still to reach out to them. But yet even His mercy they reject. And so we see the the nature of sin unpacked there. This reality that our hearts, like theirs, in fact, and as Jaco said earlier, have all gone astray. That this thing called sin that today is so glossed over that, that even... It's become a sin. To use the word sin is the world we live in. But the Bible doesn't gloss over it. We might try and sweep it under the carpet, but but God doesn't. I mean, have we maybe forgotten God at times? Have we maybe taken God for granted at times? Have we maybe, like these people of Israel, treated God with contempt? Have we maybe even, because of our sin, been blinded and forsaken God, lived without any fear or regard for Him? Because the New Testament in Romans chapter 3 has the same indictment that Jeremiah 17 had where Paul writes, for none is righteous, not even one. No one understands, no one seeks God, for all have turned aside. Together have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. So friends, that includes me and that includes you. It says one author writes, no, one author writes, we can no more choose not to be sinners than a fish can choose not to be a swimmer. It's in our nature. Very politically incorrect to say, though. Because we live in a day and age where where, where the concept of guilt is something that is regarded as a psychological disorder that needs to be suppressed or medicated because it's going to affect your self-esteem. Not realizing that even guilt is a mercy of God, like pain is a mercy of God to protect you from greater harm. More so, we live in a day and age where right and wrong is relative. Oh, what a tragedy and what a travesty. Where there's less and less acceptance of a transcendent or fixed standard of right and wrong. That right and wrong is now a personal prerogative It's no longer a divine prerogative. So what is right for you is right. More so, what feels right for you is right. In the words of a singer from a generation maybe ago, Cheryl Crow, if it makes you happy, it can't be that bad. And the world is shouting, 
Amen to that. Nothing wrong with being happy. But everything wrong with that being the basis for truth. But even worse, all this has led to making even an idol of personal freedom and self-fulfillment and self-expression to the extent, and I'm using this as an example to highlight how completely unaware and desensitized the world has become to sin, to the extent that the reality or truth as obvious and basic as gender is now up for grabs. The fact that God has made us male and female no longer matters. The fact that basic anatomy and physiology makes gender clear is irrelevant. And that should shock us. It should shock us. It should cause us to fall down. That sexual orientation and gender discrimination, or at least gender determination, not discrimination, gender determination is your choice. Sexual orientation and gender determination is your choice. You decide it. And it's not out there, it's right here, to quote an excerpt from an article last year from, an own, from our own George Herald, where it says, we live in a world that now acknowledges gender diversity. Gender diversity. I thought gender was always binary, male and female. But gender diversity. People need to be supported in being the gender they identify with and, and feel is their authentic self. It is increasingly accepted by healthcare professionals that gender identity operates on a spectrum rather than being a fixed binary either or state. And so all I'm saying is, is, is we've got to realize that the, that, that the basis, what this gender crisis shows is how, how the basis and the source of truth has shifted from divine and transcendent to self and personal, from being objective to being subjective. And it is scary because you ask the question, what's next to be accepted, incest or pedophilia? Because the question is, well, where do you draw the line then? Or who draws the line? Be appalled, O heavens, Jeremiah writes in chapter 2, where he says, Be appalled, O heavens, at, at this and be shocked and utterly desolate, declares the Lord. For all my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have hewn out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. He's calling all of creation to look in at man who was the crown of creation and see what a travesty that we have made of our responsibility, what we have made of God's order and of God's design, that we have even rejected gender and sexual orientation that God has set up. So what does all this mean for us? Well, it means three things as we end this morning, if you are by any chance still with me. And I'm going to end quickly. It's been heavy to talk about sin in this direct way this morning. But that's the thing that we cannot leave out of our understanding of the world. It's the one piece of the puzzle that is essential. The world is wanting to remove it, but you remove it. And then all you do is replace the fountain of living water with empty cisterns. All you do is, is, is remove guilt and set yourself up for only more pain and only more failure, not least, of all, not least of all eternal. So what does this all mean for us? Well, first of all, we need to get back to something of a fear of God. As we saw last week, the first piece in this puzzle of the world is that God made it, and, and He is the Creator, and He is the one who reigns, and He is the one who rules. He alone is righteous, and so He sets the standard of right and wrong. This book that we call the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, is the self-revelation of the only true God in, whom, in which we read about the ultimate revelation of Jesus Christ, the Son of God who became flesh. But that's the standard. That's the good news. Which we'll never appreciate unless we understand the bad news. 
And so it's realized that every single one of us, our lives are accountable to God first and foremost. It's funny how we have a fear of being caught by the cops without a seatbelt on. We see a cop and we do something, don't we? Or how we are fearful about being caught by our parents on dodgy websites. And we respond if we need to hide our phones. Yet we forget that God's all-seeing eyes on us 24-7. In the light and in the dark. In the day and at night. We worry if Mark Zuckerberg or Bill Gates might somehow, and maybe even Google, all partnering together, might hack into all our private social media information, might hack into our WhatsApp accounts, and read all our conversations. And what then? We must move to Telegram. And what then? God has already seen every single one of those conversations. God has already seen every photo you've taken on your phone. Surely that should concern us a bit more. And so this morning, you've got to ask, have you been outright resisting God? Have you been outright standing in the place of God? Have you been suppressing the truth in your life of the reality of God? Perhaps you've been standing with just cause, so you think, blaming God, being angry at God and judging God, using this excuse, well, if God is good, He wouldn't allow the suffering in your life, and so that is causing you to reject God. Blaming God instead of beginning to see that maybe you need to start with yourself. You see, if you haven't done this before in your life, every single one of us have to, as they do in war, when they realize that there's no longer a chance of victory, when they realize their backs are against the wall and there's no escape, you raise the white flag. And maybe that's what you've got to do this morning if you've never have raised your right flag and admit to God you surrender. Admit to God that you are the one who needs to take all the blame. That you need to humble yourself before God. It's as C.S. Lewis writes, In God you come up against something which is in every respect immediately superior to yourself. Unless you know God as that, and therefore know yourself as nothing in comparison, you do not know God at all. As long as you are proud, you cannot know God. A proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you're looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. We need to come back to fearing God. Secondly, we need to appreciate the sinfulness of sin. We've seen the nature of sin in in some kind of detail this morning, that, that sin is serious and it has consequences. The consequences are eternal. I mean, the Bible doesn't hide that. It says clearly that the wages of sin is death. The due payment of sin is death. That every time you sin, it only produces one result, ultimately, regardless of what you experience. It only pays one thing, and that is death, every single time. Death, death, death. It never brings life. It's funny, if you just think of gravity, it's so so wonderful that God has actually made gravity in this world, and I think He's done it for good reason. He's given us a physical, tangible, vivid kind of daily reminder in the physical world of what things are like in the spiritual world. I mean, you can jump off a 12-story building saying, or singing, if you choose, I believe I can fly, I believe I can touch the sky, But gravity will always have the last say. No matter how well you sing it even. And so likewise, you can say, I believe I am right. I believe I can live my own way. But God too will always have the last say in your life. And in both cases, you realize it's death. And so we need to realize that that sin matters, and not just the big sins like murder and adultery. You see, because we often tend to compare ourselves to, to one another, don't we? And we kind of think, I'm not as bad as, as, as so-and-so. But what we need to remember is that two men 
standing at the foot of Mount Everest, don't argue about who's taller, do they? And so in the same way, we're not here to live our lives comparing ourselves to one another. We compare ourselves to God alone. And before Him, we all stand and we all fall. And so before Him, every lie, every lustful thought, every harsh word, as we sang earlier, every angry action, it all betrays His holiness and condemns us. It all falls short, falls short of His glory. Shout out to Romans 3.23, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's not about falling short of your potential. It's not about falling short of other people's expectations. It's not about f- falling short of society's norms. It's about falling short of God's glory. And so where have maybe you and I been entertaining respectable sins in our lives? Watching Netflix series, maybe, that we shouldn't be watching. Doing stuff on our phones, maybe, that we shouldn't be doing. Gossiping about people. Having an attitude of rebellion towards authority. Using our money in ways that is completely materialistic and self-centered. Where, where perhaps do we need to repent before God this morning? Because every sin we do amounts to idolatry. Everything we do is not simply not worshiping God, it is always worshiping something else. As John Calvin said, the human heart is a perpetual factory of idols. The Bible does not allow us to marginalize idolatry to the fringes of life. It is found on center stage in our hearts. And so every sin matters because every decision or action or thought or word we do and say every day is either worshiping God or something else. And so in light of all this, the reality of fearing God and the reality of the sinfulness of sin we come lastly to, to say as we end then, in light of all of that, to realize, uh, to realize our great need of God's mercy. That God has been so patient with all of us today. Every single one of us, He has been so, so patient. It's amazing. I mean, If there's a car driving in front of me that is going just five kilometers slower than what I am, I get impatient. And that's only after even five seconds of driving behind him. Maybe some of you, I hope, can relate. And yet God, in his infinite holiness and our utter sinfulness, has been patient with us, not just for days, not just for weeks, not just for months, but for years and years. And that grace has extended to us not just in common grace and giving us breath and giving us food and giving us clothing and still being alive and not having said, Tilly, that's enough, I'm wiping you out today. You're gone. That's it. No. No. We've all benefited from common grace in spite of our wanton sinfulness. But ultimately, God has extended His grace to us in Jesus. That God, knowing that because of our sin, that we would never find Him or never turn to Him, we would never seek Him, we would never be righteous, that we would never change. And so God came to us God came to be something He was not, becoming a man in Jesus Christ. He took on our unrighteousness, our sin, when He was perfectly innocent and righteous and without sin. On the cross, Jesus was forsaken by God 
for every time that you and I have forsaken God. I mean, we, we were sinners. We were His enemies. We were rebels. And yet He has provided salvation for us. Do we really get that? And so someone has said, God's forgiveness is not like me forgiving my kids for reading with a torch under their covers after bedtime. It is more like me adopting into my family a terrorist who murdered one of my children. And yet people still want to reject a God like that, a God who extends such mercy. Have you not seen, have you not learned to hate the sin that wants to destroy your soul? Pastor, author, J.D. Greer writes, if we cover our sin, God will expose it in judgment. If we rely on our strength, God will abandon us to weakness. If we boast in our wisdom, God will leave us in darkness. But if we expose our sin to Jesus in all its inglorious ugliness, He will cover it with His extravagant grace. If we confess our weakness, He will fill us with His strength. If we admit our foolishness, He will bestow His wisdom upon us. If we allow ourselves to be undone in His presence, He will piece us back together in His love. Maybe God is calling you to do that today, non-Christian or Christian. Well, let me conclude. About a century ago, a newspaper editor asked the question, what is wrong with the world? And there were many replies to that question. But the one that stood out, and was, but the one that stood out was by philosopher turned Christian G.K. Chesterton. His answer, in fact, was the best, even though it was the shortest. And he wrote, Sir, in answer to your question, what is wrong with the world? I am. Yours sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. And so you want the explanation for corruption in governments? You want an explanation for broken relationships? You want an explanation for disease? You want an explanation for unemployment? You want an explanation for poverty? You want an explanation for natural disasters? You want an explanation for loneliness? You want an explanation for betrayal? You want an explanation for death? It's ultimately only the Christian narrative that has that piece of the puzzle in its right place and calling it what it is, sin our sin that is brought upon God's curse in this world. We have caused our planet to be stained. But God has sent Jesus to wipe away every stain. And so it's not the end of the story, our rebellion. The story ends with the great rescue, which we're going to look at more next week. The story ends, even as we have seen today, in this amazing, unrelenting, never giving up mercy of God. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this great mercy that you have bestowed upon us, in spite of us, and all that we have done in our sinfulness, in all of our waywardness, in all of our rejection of you. And so, O oh God, we realize we can sit here on this hot morning, feeling flustered, feeling sweaty, feeling sticky, wishing we were somewhere else, like at the beach. And yet that is merely a drop in the ocean of what awaits us in terms of despair and anguish one day in eternity if we are not today found in Christ. If we have not today repented of our sin and put our faith in Jesus Christ. Sure, O oh God, Hell is real, and we are lost. But you have come to find us. By your power of your Holy Spirit, O God, work in our hearts. May our sin grieve us. May we hate what is evil and cling to what is good. May we live for righteousness, no matter the cost 
in this world of relativity and immorality. O oh God, we do pray that we would find ourselves as your people to be worshipping you above all else in good times and in bad times. For you alone are God, our Creator and our Saviour. Amen.